Good morning, everyone. I'm Tracy Ormsby, publisher of the Adirondack Explorer. Thank you for joining us this morning for Green Power, Green Park, a discussion of renewable energy projects and potential in the Adirondacks. We're glad to have so many of you here this morning. We're full. This is part of an ongoing series of discussions the Adirondack Explorer is hosting around the issues we're reporting on. Today's talk is based on Explore policy reporter Gwendolyn Craig's recent article about how the Adirondack Park's evolving electric producers can help New York's climate goals. We're gonna talk with the panelists for about a half hour and then we'll open this up to questions. So please, as you think of them, just put them in the chat below or in the, sorry, Q and A below and we will uh, try to get to as many of them as we can. So last year, New York passed the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, setting ambitious goals to require carbon-free electricity production by 2040 and an 85% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. With us today are three people deeply involved in these efforts. Noah Shaw is co-chair of the Renewable Energy Practice at Hodgson Russ LLP. Noah and his colleagues represent a broad range of renewable energy, energy efficiency, and clean transportation developers, acquirers, lenders, government entities, and others. Prior to joining Hodgson Rush in September 2019, Noah was general counsel at the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, better known as NYSERDA, where he had a hand in the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Conrad Karsten serves as a project manager of Community Solar at RER Energy Group and its sister company, Sunvestment Group. In addition to siting and developing solar projects, Conrad currently oversees the acquisition and management of subscribers of, for RER's portfolio of community solar projects, including the one here in Saranac Lake. Emmett Smith, co-founded NP&L in 2018 to connect his family's hydroelectric plant, Asia Mountain Power in St. Regis Falls, directly to local customers using New York's community distributed generation program. He is also an advocate for run of river hydroelectric power as a renewable energy source in several proceedings before the New York State Department of Public Service. Gwendolyn Craig is an environmental policy reporter with a master's degree in journalism from Syracuse University and several years of daily newspaper experience in New York State. She covers Adirondack related government in Albany, Raybrook and travels throughout the park to report on those policies enacted. Welcome all four of you and I'll let you take it from here. I'm unmuted, I think, right? No, oh, you're, you're live. All right. Yeah, well, thank you all, all three of you again for, for joining us here and thanks to the audience for being here. Um, I know just like from me being a reporter covering climate change, like a lot of times we wanna visualize this for people and um, it's in Syracuse, I actually went down to Florida and you know, you have people building their houses on stilts because of sea level rise. It's very obvious there, whereas here it might be a little more nuanced and um, just some examples that we've covered, you know, we're seeing ticks um, at higher elevations. They're surviving our winters. We're seeing um, hemlock woolly adelgid on the eastern shore of Lake George surviving our winters. So I think those are some concrete examples of of climate change impacting the park right now. And, um, you know, now we have the state's uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Um, you know, we're trying to find ways of how the Adirondacks specifically can help curb where we're going. So um, I'm, I'm so glad we're all here to, to talk about what's what's happening and what what's down the pipeline and um, how we play a role. And I know um, we're not really gonna talk about it today, but forests, are, are such an important part of that as a carbon sink. Um, but we also wanna, at, at least today, kind of acknowledge the renewable energy projects that are happening. And um, um, I'm glad we can we can all start to talk about that. Um, I think, Noah, if you don't mind, I'll start with you and just ask a little bit about, um, you know, this, this law is so 
um, ambitious. And I think on, on paper, it's, uh, it's so impressive, but we want to, we want to see like, you know, how does this actually get enacted? How do we get to these, these goals? And, and, um, I don't know if you could just bring in a little bit about the, the Public Service Commission news uh, from last week and, and kind of the, the steps to, to take. Can you just give us an overview on, on how do we actually achieve something like this? Well, thanks, Gwendolyn. Um, it's, uh, you know, you're calling for a super lawyerly answer and I'll try to keep it, I'll try to keep it uh, consumer friendly. Um, and first of all, just thank you for the invitation to be here today. Thank you to all the other panelists. It's great to be talking about this this issue that is the cross section of so much of what I love. Um, uh, and to the explorer for holding these conversations, it's a it's a real value and uh, and it's a pleasure to to be part of it. So, the CLCPA, which passed last year, as I think you mentioned, um, had a number of sort of primary and what we call sort of sub goals. The primary goals are reducing greenhouse gas emissions 85% across the economy below 1990 levels, which will put us at you know, pre-industrial greenhouse gas um, uh, 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 emission levels by, by mid-century. Um, and in order to get there, uh, there are a number of sub goals, including 70% renewable energy consumption in the state by 2030. That doesn't mean 70% generation in the state, it means consumption, which is a big difference because some energy comes from outside the state. It means um, nine gigawatts of offshore wind by 2035. That's almost a third or approximately a third of what we expect the state's electricity demand to be in 2035. So that's a huge chunk of the, of the um, of the of the solution, it means 100% clean energy by 2040. Clean is not necessarily the same as renewable because clean in the definition includes nuclear. Um, and so the question of what happens with the upstate nuclear uh, facilities in the 2030s is is still to be determined. Um, it means six gigawatts of distributed solar. And what I mean by distributed solar uh, by 2030 is uh, usually projects like five megawatts, like Conrad's project, and smaller. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't mean the it doesn't mean the huge you know sort of uh, two thousand acre solar farms that are happening in some places in the North Country and west and western New York. Um, so that's six gigawatts of of distributed solar by twenty thirty, which is a we've got a long way to go. Um, so there are a number of these sort of sub goals that the that the legislation set out. Um, and what happens is the Public Service Commission then, as the sort of regulator of the utilities, uh, has to issue all the rules and all of the ways that, you know, mechanically uh, the state can get there. And it gets pretty wonky sometimes. Um, but the last week, the Public Service Commission took what I'd say is the, you know, the most significant step so far in implementing the CLCPA by uh, adopting the 70 by 30, 70% renewable energy by 2030 standard um, and, implement, and specifying uh, the, uh, the number of renewable energy credits that actually have to be purchased in the state by NYSERDA uh, by 2030 in order to hit that goal. It also instituted um, a new program called the tier four program um, don't get lost in the in the in the nomenclature, but basically what it does is it provides an incentive for um, clean, uh, well, no, for renewable electricity uh, to plug directly into New York City. So what that means is, um, you know, upstate wind and solar, but also importantly, Canadian hydro um, under certain circumstances, um, very specific circumstances in terms of eligibility uh, can. Uh, now sell their electricity through new transmission that plugs directly into New York City and have a separate uh, compensation structure that will actually value that. Because what we see is, and I think the, you know, there was a line in, in one of the recent, recent documents from the state that really our New York State's energy system is a tale of two systems. Um, the upstate system is really very, very clean already, right? I mean, it's mostly nuclear, wind, and hydro. Uh, the downstate system, however, is extraordinarily dirty. Um, and so how do we balance that and get the clean electrons south? Um, that is the big sort of uh, question for uh, state policymakers to tackle. And that's what tier four uh, intends to do. And then 
the last thing I'll talk about in terms of what happened last week at the Public Service Commission, um, and but I'm sure Emmett will pick it up, <laughs> is uh, there has long been a, a request by some of the older generation units, hydro and wind in particular, um, to continue to be supported uh, to uh, by the state. The idea being that if the state doesn't continue to support them, they're just going to sell their their wrecks um, elsewhere um, into New England, most likely, um, and and then the state loses the benefit of that generation. So the state, uh, the Public Service Commission authorized a program to support those facilities um, for a few years. <laughs> uh, those those generators didn't get uh, everything that they wanted, um, but I think even the order called it a quote unquote stopgap solution. So there's more. There are more, uh, more, more chapters to be written in that regard. But um, the state is, frankly, doing more than it has in the past uh, to try to support some of those legacy resources so they don't start selling their resources elsewhere. And that's. I'll stop talking there. It's a sort yeah. of a mouthful. But there's a lot to. There's a lot to go through. But that's the summary. I think. Oh, I appreciate that. That was a good overview. And I, I think Emma, do you mind if I just kind of turn to you and say? Um, if you could give us an update on how hydro is doing and and your thoughts on on the latest uh, news. Sure. Um, well, just a little bit of background. Uh, the clean energy standard, which was the previous program um, that the CLCPA is built on, provides um, subsidies essentially from the state to new renewable generators, but it did not provide any subsidies to existing renewable generators. And uh, the problem was in, uh, specifically in this region that the subsidized new capacity was driving down the wholesale price for all the existing resources in the region. So all the new wind farms built up in Chattagay and over in um, Lewis County were really uh, pushing down the, the prices for, uh, for hydro. So not only were we not getting any compensation for our renewable contributions, but the wholesale price that we rely on was also being pushed down. And it's important to realize that about 11% of all the electricity consumed in New York comes from independent hydro. So it's the single largest contributor to where we currently are on our pathway to that 70 by 30 goal. And we've been advocating for a long time that, you know, if you're going to subsidize the competition, you have to also, you know, compensate us in a similar way so that we can remain viable. Um, and they've been resistant to that for quite a long time. I've been involved in this in this uh, issue for quite a while. And they, yeah, the tier two program, which they unveiled last week, is kind of a stopgap. It's basically uh, it'll provide support for most of the generators, and I up to nice sort of how whether that's fifty one percent or ninety nine percent over a five year period in three year contracts. So it's a sort of a step in the right direction, but it's not really significant uh, because the problem we're facing is that a lot of these power plants are getting very old and they need reinvestment. The median age of the hydro dam in New York State is 81 years and the Adirondacks, I would suspect it's even older. Uh, and these dams need to be replaced or rebuilt or you know repaired and that's a very significant capital expenditure which you can't finance based on a three-year rec contract so there's also a repowering provision uh in the clcp in the the update that came out last week but it's it's not quite workable we might you know we'll probably have a, a petition to see if we can get it to be a little bit better but you know, it's it's a big, it's a really big challenge. I mean, hydro is critical to our clean energy goals. And, you know, I think the state has been hesitant to provide broad-based support because they don't want to benefit facilities that don't need it. And they don't want to benefit companies that could afford it uh, uh, to keep going without it. And I, I get that tension, but um, for the Adirondack region, I think that's probably the biggest sort of unanswered question about uh, how our region and our facilities will be affected by the new climate law. Well, well thank you for that overview. And um, I'm going to come back to, to you and um, on, uh, a little bit more about what you're what you're doing right now in the Adirondacks. And I'm just going to switch over to Conrad Maybe here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll come back. Um, Conrad, can you, and also I'm seeing some questions uh, in the chat and the Q&A, you're welcome to submit questions there. 
Um, we're just gonna do a quick overview um, with my questions till about 9.30, and then I'm gonna get, uh, Tracy and I will get to the chat questions, um, but feel free to keep asking them there, um, but we will, we will get to them. Um, so Conrad, I just wanted to come over to you. Um, we, we saw your community solar project go up uh, in Saranac, or just outside of Saranac Lake. Um, and just wondering, you know, the Adirondacks itself is um, kind of a different landscape just with zoning wise. Um, we have, you know, different layers of a different governments and agency layers. We've, we have different land use um, layers and, um, I, it seems like, as, as you had said to me in, for our story, this was sort of a needle in a haystack place um, to do this project. I'm just wondering if you can walk us through sure. um, why this was possible and uh, it, you know what, what your thoughts are about other places. It seems like this was in a hamlet, which is one of those um, areas uh, for the land use map that more, more things can happen without as many uh, um, at permitting avenues, I guess, is maybe the best way to put it. Sure, yeah, no, that's a great question, uh, Gwen, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about <clears throat> the project in, in, the, in that context. Um, so my, my company has actually been uh, in the Adirondacks trying to site solar projects for probably the last five or six years now. Um, and uh, in many ways, the, the Saranac Lake Community Solar Project was you know, it, it was a uh, needle in a haystack um, uh, in that, uh, as you said, it's located within a hamlet, which is the most developer friendly um, of the development zones in the park. I think there are four, uh, you know, kind of tiers. Um, the, uh, as I'm sure you know, the Adirondack Park Agency uh, takes its its um, job very seriously to, to keep the park um, you know, forever wild. Um, we found that, uh, you know, and that they, they essentially add an additional layer of oversight. There's another authority having jurisdiction that you have to um, submit permits to, you know, in, in addition to the local um, permitting office. Um, we found that uh, they were extremely collaborative um, and, uh, you know, from the from the start, they kind of helped us avoid the pitfalls um, of developing in the park. Um, the The challenge for us as the developer was to keep the design somewhat fluid um, so that we could, you know, observe compliance. Um, so we were very pleased with 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 that uh, and, and with working working with the APA. <clears throat> um, the other uh, way in which this project was. A needle in the haystack, um, and it kind of has to do with the the vision for the project. Um, is that we we found a very motivated local landowner who was very interested in putting a community solar project on uh, a piece of land that he purchased, I think, twenty or so years ago. Um, his vision for the project, which by extension became our vision, was you know this is a local pro project. It's owned locally, it's going to be subscribed locally, the benefits of the project in every sense, um, you know, the tax benefits, uh, the uh, local job creation, uh, the savings, the environmental benefits, they would all stay within the community. So um, as to whether that is a replicable model in, in New York, I, I am not so sure, but um, I certainly hope it is. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I, I wonder if you can, um, I know you're based out of Washington, D.C., but um, just from from working in New York mm -hmm. and, and setting this up, um, how, are, how, are, how is community solar and then this project in particular going to contribute to the climate law goals? Sure. Well, yeah, so Noah mentioned the, the, the six gigawatt um, goal, I think, um, installed solar and in, in, installed distributed solar in New York is at about 2.4 gigs, so they, they have a ways to go. Um, that's an enormous amount of uh, installation and development, and by extension, an enormous amount of, um, you know, economic uh, impact. Um, so in terms of how community solar is, is going to impact uh, the Adirondacks, um, 
I mean, one of the big things about a, a local project um, is that uh, it, um, at least this project, is that it, it has a large economic impact. Um, you know, we, uh, in developing the project, we created, you know, electrical engineering jobs, marketing jobs, uh, installation jobs, so on and so forth. Um, so in addition to the, the climate goals, um, the, which are very ambitious, um, I think you're going to see a lot of uh, economic impact. Um, and I will say that in terms of community solar, which you know, is not just unique to New, to New York, uh, but several other uh, states have their own various different programs. I mean, New York has really made itself into a uh, nationwide leader in that respect. There's been a lot of community solar development in New York over the last couple of years uh, since the program started in 2016. So um, now I believe that at this time, uh, our project is, uh, our project will be the first community solar project in the Adirondack Park uh, by the time that it's completed, it probably be in December. Um, but I understand there are a couple more in development now, which is certainly good news. Yes, yeah, so we saw the Adirondack Park Agency just approve uh, one in Thai. And I think I was going to ask, so Conrad and Noah, maybe if you both have a minute to talk about it quickly. Um, there is sort of, um, I'm sure there's a concern out there about changing the landscape or the views um, of the park. And um, can you talk a little bit about how, I, I, I believe when we talked the Saranac Lake uh, Solar, Community Solar Project was already in, a, in an existing field or, or like open space. Um, or how do, you, how do we balance that going forward, making sure that um, this, the views and the, the trees and things like that are all um, taken into account, I guess, um, for those that are concerned, they're gonna see like this giant uh, solar array. Yep. Well, let me jump in. Um, you know, I think that's just extraordinary. I mean, it's important all over the state, right? I mean, citing questions and how to make sure that um, renewable energy and what we call sort of responsible citing um, go together is, is a challenge no matter where you are. Um, in some areas of the state, it's about farming and farmland. In other areas, it's about woodlands. Um, uh, and in the Adirondacks, obviously, that is a, a, an extraordinarily important piece of the, of the, of the equation. Um, you know, as a kid who grew up in Warren and Essex counties, and I'm now on the board of the Adirondack Council and the New York League of Conservation Voters down in the Capital District, these are issues that, um, but also somebody who represents solar developers all over the state, <clears throat> um, including in the Adirondacks, full, full disclosure. Um, you know, the, 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 the needle to thread here um, is just extraordinarily important because it's going to set a precedent for uh, future projects that come down the line. It's going to be uh, either held up as a success um, for the solar industry and a way that the solar industry can work with uh, local permitting requirements and communities or held up as, you know, an example of how things get rammed pe down people's throats, which um, nobody wants. So, uh, you know, I think um, the first thing to do, and Conrad and his and his uh, colleagues are out there doing it, is is finding, you know, sites that make sense, right? I mean, you, there's a lot of, it's 6 million acres, folks. It's as big as the state of Vermont, right? There's a lot of the Adirondack Park um, that is not necessarily, uh, that doesn't look like, you know, your background, Gwen. Um, and so, you know, there are places, as you just mentioned, in around Ticonderoga, on the outskirts of the park, where, 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 where siting can make sense. And frankly, those locations are most often uh, best situated when it comes to interconnecting into transmission systems, because there are large, large high voltage transmission lines that are coming down along Lake Champlain or through the Tug Hill. Um, and so for a lot of reasons, it makes sense for the developers to really look hard and use common sense about where they want to put a project, which will, you know, A, garner community support, which is really, really important, and B, make their permitting uh, processes more efficient. I do think that, um, in my experience so far, the APA has been very collaborative. Um, uh, and I worked a little bit with them when I was general counsel at NYSERDA about how to get some of this stuff right. Um, 
So, you know, the state is supportive, uh, but, you know, the Adirondack Park is a different animal uh, when it comes to building anything and, and solar will be no exception. Yeah, just to just quickly add to what Noah is saying and maybe say something that's a little bit reassuring. Um, he's absolutely right in that uh, the infrastructure, the existing infrastructure is very important uh, when siting solar. Uh, and um, it's not terribly built out in the Adirondacks at the, you know, at the transmission or distribution level. So um, siting solar projects is, is very constrained by that. Um, I don't know if, uh, I, I think Noah's frozen. I'm not sure if you guys can hear me right now. Um, okay, good, good. Yeah, so um, in that sense, uh, you know, once again, this project is very much a needle in a haystack. Uh, and it's also um, in order to, um, you know, in order to mitigate some of the, uh, uh, the kind of post-development um, effects on the site. Uh, one of the things that we're, we're doing is seeding it with pollinator-friendly vegetation. Um, okay. So uh, it's, it's another way that this project could be a model for potential development, solar development in the park. Um, you know, these, these uh, projects are uh, they are land intensive, but they uh, are not uh, necessarily damaging to the land. You know, they can play multiple roles and conservation is certainly a role that they can play. No, thank you for that. Um, so I wanted to jump back to Emmett. Um, we talk a lot about community solar and the, the model for that, but then Emmett was talking to us about how this is actually, um, you know, more of it. Well, actually, I'm going to let you you t talk about it, but you're doing s something similar with, with hydropower, but you talked about it as community distributed generation that maybe there's is always talking about solar, but <clears throat> it's really there's there's other opportunities out there for different forms of energy to use this this kind of model. Um, and can you can you talk about what you're doing up in the North Country and how that's working? Sure. Well, first of all, just to address what you just brought up, I mean, the, the program uh, that both uh, community solar projects and community hydro projects use is called Community Distributed Generation. And the program is uh, open to all technologies that are defined as renewable by the clean energy law. So uh, our project in, Azure, in St. Regis Falls, Azure Mountain Power was the first community renewable project in the Adirondacks and actually only the second statewide to use hydro. So our story, essentially, uh, my family has a small hydro plant in St. Regis Falls, which they built at the site of an existing dam in the early 1990s. And uh, we've been sort of enduring the uh, long decline in energy prices I alluded to earlier. And 2014, we had a, a, our third 100 year flood in our 30 years of operation that washed out, um, partly washed out the old timber crib dam, uh, which actually went back in part probably to the late 19th century. And uh, we were faced with the cost of replacing it uh, without, uh, without the kind of you know, robust energy prices that I referred to. So we wound up uh, doing it ourselves. We did get a little bit of help uh, through ANCA um, and we built a timber crib dam of uh, 600 logs, 2 million pounds of stone, uh, just with a six man crew from St. Regis Falls and ourselves. And um, that kind of re refocused my attention on the hydro project and on how to bring it into the next century really. And community distributed generation was sort of our our best option for uh, achieving a better than wholesale market revenue. And the way it kind of works is you're sort of cutting out the middleman. So it's a little bit like a CSA. If you get people to say, I wanna get my power from you, then uh, you know, we get paid more of the value that, the, that and, uh, the utility gets less of a cut, but it just involves direct customer relationships, which is something we had never done before, something we had no expertise in and uh, we founded Northern Power and Light specifically to take on that task for Azure Mountain Power and for other hydros. And we've since gone on and we have a, we have a nine megawatt pipeline of 
projects that we're going to be doing this for. And we're currently subscribing another generator, customers for another generator over in Potsdam, New York. Uh, and I think CDG has a, has a real important role to play in New York's climate goals broadly and specifically in the Adirondacks for supporting the existing resources that we all rely on. It really gives people uh, one of the few elements of the CLCPA that gives individual ratepayers a real opportunity to connect with a resource and direct their energy dollar towards something they want to have in their community, whether it's a solar array or whether it's the hydro dam that creates the, the pond that they go canoeing on, you know, it, it really gives them a direct economic voice. And it also avoids to some degree the need for subsidies that are that are paid for by all ratepayers. So it's really kind of a kind of a win-win. It, it saves it saves on state subsidies and it gives community members a voice. And uh, it's really important. And particularly for small hydro in the Adirondacks, given the absence of other state support, uh, it's a really, a really great uh, thing. And we find that people really respond to it. People respond to the authenticity of connecting to a local resource that they're familiar with, of dealing with a company that was founded in the Adirondacks. And, you know, just of having that economically democratic voice in the direction of New York's climate goals. Oh, that's great. Um, we're almost at our time where we need to start switching to questions, but I just wanted to quickly ask, um, how is the, um, if, I don't know if you could do like a, a, a 30 second answer, but how, how is being in the Adirondacks both like a benefit? What's, what, what about being in the Adirondacks helps you with your, your models specifically or with these renewable energy projects and, and where there may be challenges because you're in the Adirondacks? I don't know if you could do a short, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's funny. It, I was, I've been thinking about this because it was on your list of potential questions. And it's, it's funny, it, it's funny to me to think about, you know, how we benefit and how we're challenged by being in the Adirondacks because hydro is here because of the Adirondacks, you know, the Adirondack mountains capture precipitation, turn it into running and flowing water. That's why water power resources were located here. That's why dams were built in the 19th century. That's why electrical generation was added to those dams in, in the early 20th century and in the late 20th century. And that's, that's you know, it's, it's all integrated with the ecology of the region. You know, one of the important things to realize about a switch to a more renewable power grid is you have to identify the renewable resources that fit naturally with the ecology of different regions. And this is, this is you know, very natural in the Adirondacks. Um, you know, most of the independent hydro in the state is located in the broader North Country region and all of that is fed by rivers that originate in the Adirondacks. So, you know, we're, that's, that's the primary uh, benefit from a technological perspective. Um, you know, I think part of your question is, is uh, sort of asking about regulation. And it's true that in the early 20th century in the early days of the forever wild uh, law, you know, it was very, it became very difficult to build new hydro dams as you would expect. But one's trying to build new hydro dams now. So mostly what we're doing is maintaining the existing ecosystem. And in fact, one of the reasons we had to replace our dam in 2014 is we're responsible for maintaining the water line of that stretch of the St. Regis River. Like that, that's something we're required to do by the DEC. It would have not been good if we had not been able to do that. Uh, so you know, it's it's when we're talking about maintaining existing resources, the regulatory burden as a very different kind of animal. But one other thing I'll add is with our, our model specifically, uh, since we've started doing individual customer subscription is it's been very beneficial to be in the Adirondacks because we're, we're looking for customers in a population that is primed for this kind of opportunity. It's a population that uh, it takes the ecology of the region very seriously, values the, you know, the, the resources that are here and we're, we already understands the importance of supporting local businesses in a place where the eco economy has been in decline for a long time. So the Adirondack population has been a, a new asset that I hadn't really uh, understood for the last couple of years. And Conrad, I think you were saying like that's something similar with your project. You're trying to keep everything local. And right. um, I don't know if you can 
do a quick sure rundown. Yeah, challenges and benefits. Um, yeah, no, uh, I'll start with the benefits. No, um, sorry, Emmett is absolutely right. Um, the 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 region is primed for this sort of um, engagement and development. Um, we've been very pleased with uh, the excitement around the Santa Clay Community Solar Project. Um, and we are, you know, looking for new opportunities to build uh, new community solar projects uh, as a result. Um, uh, yeah, no, the, the, the project, or sorry, the park is relatively undeveloped, uh, which is, you know, good for us as a solar developer. Um, and uh, uh, the we've resolved kind of the trickier nature of developing within the park, um, which is once again good for us as a solar developer. Um, it, in terms of challenges, um, you know, uh, first and foremost, uh, in the utility infrastructure has not been built out. Um, so there's not as many places where we can interconnect, um, you know, in an economical manner. Um, obviously weather is a factor, um, you know, uh, so solar, solar is a seasonal resource in many ways. Um, snow creates uh, many challenges uh, and, and there's a lot of snow in, in the Adirondacks. Um, also, finally, the, the additional layer of oversight uh, in the form of the, of the APA, um, although, you know, that's something that we've also mitigated, as I've said. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, we see it as a, as a, as a, a region that's really primed for um, community solar development. So we're very excited about it, about the project and, and the long term prospects. Well, that's great. And Noah, do you have anything to add to just about the overall? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll just add two things that I think, um, you know, real quick, and then I want to get to the cute, the questions. Um, but first is, you know, electricity in the North Country is cheap, right? So um, when, you know, the, we were talking about the community distributed generation uh, model, the way that gets compensated through the value of distributed energy resources tariff, which Sorry for all the for the words here, but you know, basically, you get paid for generation of electricity according to a, a set of values that some of which are related to the cost of electricity in the region, right? So, you're not going to get paid as much for the electrons that get generated in the North Country as you do in the Hudson Valley. It's just so. So that's a challenge, right? For a generation source um, up north, the the economics are just different than they are in other places of the state. So that's. Uh, not specific to the Adirondacks, but it's um, but it's certainly true in the Adirondacks to a large extent. In terms of opportunities, um, you know what I'd say is we were talking a minute ago about how do you get the clean electrons down to the to the city where the where the grid is actually dirty. Um, you know, one of the things that we have to do around the state in order to allow that and to quote unquote unbottle some of the big the big facilities that are selling wholesale. Um, uh, into the grid is is really ease those smaller local load pockets, right? So the the extent to which you can build generation like Conrad's in places that are close to where people are actually using the electricity, then the system and the large high tension transmission facilities can actually uh, be more successful in getting all of those electrons down through the big transmission lines to you know, to Marcy and, and through, uh, to Utica and then all the way down, you know, through the Hudson Valley to the city where we can actually clean uh, the, the downstate grid, which is, which is really what the, so it's a matter of relieving that, that need upstate in order to allow those electrons to flow downstate. So that's, that's kind of how the Adirondacks and, and, and building out the generation, the distributed generation system up north can be a part of the state's broader solution. Well, thank you for that. There's so much to follow up on, <laughs> but we'll we'll get it. We'll start answering some questions here. I don't know, Tracy, if you could sure let's start with that. And sure, there's some really interesting ones coming in, so keep them coming. Uh, uh, is National Grid the LSI for most of the Adirondacks, and what is their position on CLCPA and the solar and hydro projects being discussed? Are they a partner or an adversary? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, somebody else probably has the map of uh, the service territory, but National Grid certainly does serve a, a large portion of it. Um, I think NYSEG is in there also. Um, 
I think that's probably that's probably most of the North Country. I'm forgetting whether um, there might be another another utility in there somewhere. Uh, there are uh, there are municipal utilities in, right. in Upper and Lake Placid. So, right. yep. Um, unis. National Grid. I mean, um, you know, when 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 Conrad and others are trying to negotiate an interconnection agreement, I, I'd say that most people think they're an adversary. Um, in general, across the board, you know, when it comes to, um, uh, you know, uh, implementing community distributed generation, uh, it's been a mixed bag. Uh, but I think from the overall sort of 30,000 foot point of view, when you look at how utilities in New York State have agreed, <laughs> maybe grudgingly sometimes, but ultimately agreed to move forward with state policy, you know, since I got here in 2014 and we started REV, um, I, you know, the, the progress has been significant, right? So like lots of people like to throw rocks at the utilities, but in the end, they do what they're told um, by the Public Service Commission. And that that's, um, you know, to be commended. Hopefully you haven't given up on your project by the time you get to that end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, they're required to do it. Sometimes they drag their feet, but you know, it's their infrastructure we're connecting to and ultimately you always have to deal with them. We've dealt with them for a long time and yeah, it's complicated. And NYSEG, NYSEG is mostly, uh, there's like a NYSEG is a C-shaped region that kind of starts over in like the Chattagay area and includes Plattsburgh and down through Westport and Wadhams and Jay, and then over North Hudson all the way to Long Lake um, in a little like pocket there. And all the rest of it is is National Grid, formerly Niagara Mohawk. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So I think as Noah and Emma had both alluded to, um, uh, in the process of interconnecting to the distribution grid, the utility has a lot of power over individual developers. And so they have um you know that, that the ramifications are that um if they uh if there's a project that they that they don't particularly like uh they have a lot of ways to disrupt or delay that project um i will say uh as a solar, solar developer that operates in about 20 markets um i would say national grid is in kind of the top half of utilities in terms of um uh being generally uh, compliant and forward thinking. Um, that's not to say that we certainly haven't run into issues with them. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very complicated, um, it's a very complicated dynamic. And ultimately in the day, at the end of the day, they, they generally do what they're told, uh, what they're ordered to do by the state. So um, they, uh, they are increasingly getting on board with with CDG, um, you know, which is good and bad, I think, for independent providers like uh, Emmett and Saranac Lake Community Solar, um, you know, they're building out a method for um, providing a billing service of their own, um, which is good and bad uh, for for the small guys. Um, but uh, yeah, at the end, at the end of the day, I would say that they're in the top half of utilities in terms of. Um, uh, in, in terms of being forward thinking about renewables. Uh, here's a question that sp speaks a little bit to the rural nature of the Adirondacks. How likely is it that high capacity transmission lines will be able to access the central Adirondacks? Um, I'd say low. Um, you know, I think building 345, you know, uh, transmission lines um, into the middle of the Adirondacks through new rights of way is is very unlikely. Um, one of the things that uh, happened at the Public Service Commission, which some of you may have noticed last week, was uh, the approval of a of a of an upgrade to NIPA's existing transmission line, the Northern New York transmission line, which goes from Robert Moses all the way down to um, Marcy uh, substation outside Utica. Um, that's a big deal because it'll you know unbottle like I was talking about earlier, 
hopefully, um, some of the wind and solar projects up north so that they can actually sell that electricity during peak times. What's happening now is like when everybody's wind turbines are blowing, you know, full throttle, sometimes the New York Independent Service Operator actually has to tell them to turn off. So, quote unquote, curtail their generation because there just isn't as much enough transmission infrastructure to feed those electrons uh, where they need to go. This will help alleviate that issue. Um, but I don't see either the likelihood or probably the need to build um, large uh, capacity, you know, high tension uh, transmission lines um, any further into the central part of the park unless something happens that I don't expect, which, you know, some large population growth in, in the central part of the park. How has the pandemic affected the CDCLA goals and renewable energy development in general? Do we know how a regime change would affect the timeline? A lot of community solar projects have been put on hold uh, because of the pandemic um, and they've gotten extensions in their development timeline uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, speaking for us, we, uh, we were about to start, we delayed our subscription for our power plant in Potsdam. We were about to start in March and we decided it was not the time. <laughs> and we actually we, uh, partnered up with a distillery in Plattsburgh to make hand sanitizer for a while. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's, I imagine that, that the Saranac Lake Solar Rays has dealt with this as well. You know, it's really, it's a, it's a product that's really uh, best marketed in person. <laughs> and it's hard to do that. Obviously, a lot of the events that we would have sponsored previously have not been able to, to happen, but um, things have really, have really started to uh, move again. And I think we've all really adapted to working remotely. A lot of the all meetings I would have gone to in Albany are now virtual and uh, we're able to still meet with all of our utility people virtually. So I think it has, uh, compared to other industries, it has, has suffered little. Yeah, um, yeah to, to Emmett's point, uh, we, uh, we were fortunate to be fairly, you know, fairly well long in the development cycle for this project when the pandemic, uh, the effects of the pandemic really started to hit. Uh, we, were, we were compelled by the state to shut down construction for about a month and a half. Um, which impacted our development timeline. Uh, the project otherwise would would be up and running by now. Um, so uh, the uh, uh, as a result, we also delayed our subscription timeline, uh, and um, we were forced to adapt to the virtual landscape. Um, which uh, Emmett's absolutely right. Uh, it's hard to market a project like this virtually. It took us a little bit to get into the swing of it. And um, we also, we managed to secure a booth at the local farmer's market, uh, which really um, boosted our visibility in the community and, and uh, by extension, our, our subscription numbers. Um, so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely impacted solar, you know, the realm of solar uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, but uh, we have started to bounce back, which is, which is very good. Just a slightly higher level, I think um, the renewable energy industry is one of those industries that survived the COVID uh, or is surviving the COVID uh, outbreak, frankly, better than a lot of others. Um, yes, there was definitely, as Emma and Conrad noted, uh, hold up for construction um, in the sort of April, May, June timeframe. Uh, but I, I have to say a lot of the, especially the larger projects development cycles are, you know, two, three, four years. Um, and uh, there's a lot of work that happens like in front of computers, you know, um, during that time and in the financial industry and, uh, and otherwise to get everything sort of lined up and the, the, the high level kind of market signals, if you will, from the state and from the from uh, other states uh, to get projects built are still very much there. So I haven't seen, frankly, a slowdown in a lot of development activity, financing uh, uh, and planning from, from developers. In fact, I've seen it probably increase um, over the course of the last six months, just because the, the economic drivers, the costs are coming down so much 
um, notwithstanding COVID. Um, it's all just kind of, it's one of those markets that is um, not impervious to, but seems to be powering through the pandemic a lot better than, than other industries that are you know, getting hit so hard. In terms of a change of regime, I think there was a question in there, like what happens if, if we get a new federal government? Um, uh, you know, it could be huge. Um, there are there are significant uh, financial um, advantages to um, a change and improvement in tax policy around the investment tax credit um, and some other uh, potential um, uh, policy shifts that can happen at the federal government in terms of wholesale markets uh, policy, both upstate and downstate. I mean, there's a there's a proposal now at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to um, to, in, to impose some pretty significant in, uh, in, uh, impediments to clean energy resources being able to sell into the wholesale market. Um, uh, if, if we get a new FERC, FERC, that probably goes away. If we don't get a new FERC, then, you know, there could be some issues. Um, so I think that uh, both from a regulatory point of view and from a tax policy point of view, a new administration um, in, in Washington would very much help the industry. And if we don't, then, you know, I think uh, there's some potentially problematic things on the table. And just so, um, I don't know if our panelists can take a look at the Q and A's. There's some questions directed specifically to people that we might not get to um, so I don't know if you can type, type in some answers to, or we can, we can get to them after too. Well, there's two here for Conrad that he might be able to take uh, all at once. Um, one is, can you comment on the process you have employed to secure customers for Saranac Lake for the Saranac Lake project, and what the level of interest is? And then, uh, which environmental issues were of biggest concern uh, to the APA and community involved in permitting the solar farm? Uh, the APA yeah. didn't really have to permit, right? Because it was in the hamlet. Yeah. So the 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 uh, so and and uh, full disclosure, I was not heavily involved in the process of permitting uh, for this project. So um, my answer is going to be limited by that. Um, to the so the first question about uh, subscription. Um, so uh, we. The first thing that we did um, was meet with a whole bunch of local organizations uh, like ANCA, uh, the Adirondack Land Trust, um, ADK Action. Um, you know, the 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 thinking being, okay, well, you know, we can we can wrap this up really easily and quickly if we talk to local organizations. Uh, presumably, they have audiences that are interested in this kind of thing. Um, and they can, you know, do the work for us. Uh, that did not work. <laughs> um, uh, it, it, uh, it took a little bit more effort uh, and engagement with the local community in order to subscribe this project. Um, you know, uh, I, we spun up a uh, kind of limited targeted advertisement campaign. Um, we, uh, um, we, uh, you know, secured a booth at the farmer's market. We were there pretty much every weekend um, from, I think, mid-July uh, to October. Um, you know, it, it, uh, we, we targeted uh, local businesses. Um, we secured a large anchor tenant um, to take, uh, you know, about 40, 45% of the project's offtake. Um, it was certainly more, yeah, Adir the Adirondack Health Center. It was certainly more difficult than we thought it was going to be, but um, I think all the more rewarding for that because once we actually tried to engage, um, you know, really drill down and engage with the community, we discovered that the, the interest um, in the project and in, in community solar and community distributed uh, generation was very high. Um, and, and so, um, you know, that, that has kind of led us to uh, consider further projects in the region. Um, to the second question, uh, it's going to be short answer because I was not heavily involved, uh, but I think because this project was in a hamlet, which is the, I think the lowest tier um, 
uh, in terms of uh, impacts, de developmental impacts to the park. Um, uh, the APA was, was uh, very collaborative uh, and didn't have too many restrictions. Um, we did clear, clear a fair amount of trees for this project, um, which, uh, you know, uh, was, uh, you know, relatively easy to do in, in, um, in their terms. Um, yeah, I'm so, not sure they were involved much at all because they they were talking about the Ticonderoga project being the first one they really had to consider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, because that that one is is not in a hamlet. Um, yep. So that's that yeah, sense. it's yeah, I'm. <laughs> Just wanted to add, um, you know, Conrad was talking about uh, how rewarding it is to get, you know, really into the community for the subscription and how, how you know, rewarding that is personally, but also how that actually gets you signups. And I, I completely agree. And I just want to say for the audience, uh, you know, the hardest thing about getting people to sign up for these kinds of things is getting them to actually do it. You know, I find when I sit at a booth, I talk to all sorts of people who intend to do it, but it's not like buying chicken or something, you don't run out and then have a moment in your, in your week where you have to make a decision about what kind of electricity you want to buy. So if you're thinking about doing one of these things, do it, you know, <laughs> set up, set aside a time and go do it. it only takes a couple of minutes, you know, um, but that's, that's the real, that's the real challenge is, is uh, getting people to plan it out and take the time and go to the website and get your power bill and sign up. So yeah. Do it. And so Emmett's right. The, the, the challenge for us as developers is to make that process easy and intuitive because uh, I think the, the average American spends about six minutes a year thinking about their utility bill, something really ridiculously low like that. So, um, you know, you really need to make this process accessible. So, um, you know, and, it, and it's just a matter of creating many touch points along the way and, and reminding folks to, to, you know, complete the process. Um, so yeah, we, we actually, uh, we are at about 95% of our goal. So we have a couple of spots left. So if there's anyone on this uh, zoom call that's interested in joining the project, you can totally do that. Um, you just go to saranaclakesolar.com. So. Did you type that in the chat? And I noticed Emmett typed um, his contact information in the chat. Um, so if people want to follow up on some of this, it can reach you guys. Um, Noah, if you are, sure. and anybody that's interested, then we can, if we don't get to your questions here. Okay. I have, uh, this looks like one good last question here. Is there anything that we should be pushing for at the state level that would help to make more renewables happen in the park? Any thoughts? Depends yeah. what you mean as for yeah. more renewables to happen. You know, like I, I think that, as I've said, you know, I think that, um, and I'd be, I'd be hard pressed for to imagine anybody disagreeing with this, that, you know, the bulk of the energy produced in the Adirondacks is always going to be from hydro. Um, and so how we protect that, you know, I think, um, Actually, I think that, that CDG Hydro is a really good way of, of going about it, but also finding ways to make our voices heard in Albany that we need some kind of real robust long-term support for hydroelectric power resources. There are our baseline renewables that we really rely on. And um, you know, the, the tier two program that they released last week is sort of a step in the right direction, but um, uh, it needs, it is definitely going to need extension and expansion. I'll, I'll hop in um, and just say, uh, you know, to the extent that you're talking about new projects. Um, so um, in addition to the important rate issues that Emmett's raising with existing projects and making sure they stay online or get, or get improved, to the extent you're talking about new projects, I think that's mostly the kinds of projects that Conrad and his company have built, um, which are sort of you know, sm smaller in the grand scheme of solar, you're talking, um, you know, 20 to 35 or 40 acres of solar. Um, in order, I think what the, what what developers need um, in that 
in that market is certainty, right? It needs to be like a kind of, okay, here's what we have to do. Let's do all those things and then we'll get our project approved. The APA has been very collaborative, I think with developers and very open to conversation, but um, additional kind of rules of the road, if you will, um, and uh, uh, standards and, and conditions for um, a solar project in the park. Um, you know, taking into account all the extraordinarily important uh, factors that are unique to the park and standards that are probably going to be higher in some respects with respect to environmental and view shed and other uh, impacts that we need to, you know, make sure get implemented. But, but just having those rules be extraordinarily clear and express uh, uh, and public um, will be helpful, I think, for, you know, not only getting projects built, but getting them built smart and getting them built, um, you know, as economically uh, efficiently as possible. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, the the three of you. That was that was really great. And um, I know you guys have put your information in the chat there. If your questions weren't answered or you didn't get a chance to get their email addresses down, send your questions to Gwen and maybe she can help get them answered for you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just at Gwen at adirondackexplorer.org. I'll take it in here. Great. Thank you again. Oh, thanks all so of you. Thank you Thank so you. much for having me. This is really interesting. Bye-bye. Yeah. All right. All right. Take care.